Hello peeps, I'm Black Bright, um, broadcasting into your homes. Welcome to my channel, first time you're passing through. Well, you can like, subscribe and share. Um, I tend to talk about lots of different subjects, uh, mainly to do with unfairness and injustice and to do with what's happening in the UK because I'm born here, what's happening in Jamaica because my parents are born there and sometimes I touch on Africa because I lived there for a year and then sometimes I even talk about America because I lived there for 11 years. So I've kind of got this overall attachment to different parts of the world but which actually um, gives me a kind of a global feel um, for all my compadres around the world. So um, today um, this is about Jamaica. Um, you know, we've been talking about the deportations um, over the last few weeks. And I did a video because I was, um, I actually said that why are deportees going to Jamaica and not being met by the national um, organization for deported migrants? I even put a video in which showed how they were going to be received and you know the beautiful apartments and how they got into training and all sorts and I thought so what's happened to that how come they're not getting that little did I realize that the British government or well, the home office um, pulled the funding for the national organization for deported migrants um, through the British High Commission they just pulled the funding three days before uh, announcing the Windrush package. So they obviously thought, well, we can't pay out the Windrush package and fund the National Organization of Deported Migrants and just pulled the money. So they had to let go of all the people who they had working for them and it just went flat. Well, it didn't actually go flat. What happened was Yvonne McClymock Grant, who was one of the, the directors of the National Organization for Deported Migrants, set up Open Arms. And Open Arms is a development agency that does more or less the same thing, but not on such a grand scale. But it does meet the needs of the deportees and homeless people. And it seems like a brilliant project. I'm actually thinking about seeing if we can do a GoFundMe type of thing, because a lot of people have written to me and asked, what can we do to help deportees who have gone back? And I've been kind of lost because I didn't realise that NODM was no longer functioning. So I was kind of saying, well, they've got somebody out there already, but they're just not doing their job. But now we know that... The Open Arms Project is an authentic charity or, or you know, non-governmental organisation that could do with your support. Um, you can find them on Facebook. I'll see if I can put the link below because there are quite a few charities called Open Arms based in Manila, based in America. You have to make sure that you get the one that's uh, in Jamaica, Winwood Road, Jamaica, Kingston 16. And it's run by and co-founded by Yvonne McClymac Grant. That's the one you need. So, um, so that's that piece of information. I will put it at the bottom. And it's good because what I think happened is because she had the experience with NODM, which is the National Organization for Deported Migrants, she probably thought, well, even though the funding has gone for that, we can still help them. We can still continue to do something. And that was really magnanimous of her. Yes, she's receiving some funding from um, Friends of America, um, an organization called Friends of America. Um, she also gets some funding from the British High Commission for this. I'm not quite sure why they would pull out money for NODM, which was doing the same thing, but yet fund this one. But maybe there's less of an obligation. So she does get funding from the British government.
and she kind of looks for funding from different sources because it really is difficult to maintain. Um, we made a big hoo-ha about the 17 that the UK sent to Jamaica in a whole year. But apparently, she says, that America sends up to 50 to 70 Jamaicans deports 50 to 70 Jamaicans to Jamaica every Thursday of every week. Every Thursday of every week. 50 to 70, I think, I think the lowest she said was 40, are deported from America to Jamaica every, the last Thursday, is it the last Thursday of every week or every, every Thursday? Hmm. I'm going to have to look at that. I don't know if it's the last Thursday of the month or if it's every Thursday. Every Thursday would be a bit much. But yeah, I'll have to kind of come back to you on that um, to see how often. But the different, I mean, regardless, America is just pitching them out like nobody's business. And what they're saying, it is an influx. And how are they going to deal with this influx when they're coming in so often? Um, they seem to be coping very well. What And what's great about this is that deportees um, or involuntary migrants, we'll call them for want of a better word. Well, let, let me just tell you a bit about, I got it from the CVM television panel discussion and it was attended by the host and joined by Yvonne McClyne McGrant, co-founder of Open Arms and Kadamawe Knife, who's a lecturer at the University of West of West Indies. Now, um, let me see. Um, the British government had given the National Organisation for Deported Migrants between 160,000 and 180,000 over seven years, which is a far cry from the 25 million we were talking about and trying to find out whether or not the Jamaican government received that amount. So we still do not know. That has just gone hush-hush. We don't know what happened with that. Um, but that is how much they got over seven years. Okay, the maximum, let's call it a median figure of 150,000 over seven years. So Open Arms Development Centre offers homeless and involuntary returnees residents. They assess their needs, mental, social and physical. And it's an intervention programme that has 35% deportees and 65% homeless. Um, I am going to kind of interchange between deportees and returnees because, you know, sometimes the words just flip off my tongue, but, you know, um, just see with me there. Um, the Open Arms program gives them a comfortable place to stay, um, gives them sympathy, care, love, acceptance, a listening ear and treats them with dignity and respect. What more could they ask for? To know that that service exists must be a relief for many of the families who are either in the UK or the USA who have um, deportees going to Jamaica. Dr Kadamawi Knife said less than 7% out of the 50 deported, I think it was in 2016, were deported for criminal behaviour. These are the ones that were from England. They were overstayers and had immigration issues. So only 7% of those that were sent over were deported for criminal behaviour. And what is annoying is like I keep saying, if it's immigration related, they should not be deported. They should be removed. They should not be chained up and treated like criminals when it's an immigration issue. There should be somebody out there who makes that distinction and says, OK, these are the these are the criminals. And like I said on a um, 
earlier video, have a separate um, transportation for them when they arrive. These are the ones, these are the overstayers. And these are the hardened criminals. The 7%, these are the hardened criminals. And then the hardened criminals, if you want to chain them up because you're afraid of them, then fine. But those who have overstayed and have no criminal background, treat them with dignity. Yes, they've broken the law. Yes, they've overstayed. But it's not such a big crime. Are you telling me that you haven't done anything wrong in your life? Are you telling me when you're supposed to get out of um, a place at a certain time, you've left at that particular time? Are you telling me that everything, you followed the rule to the T in every aspect of your life? You've never extended your privilege or you've never gone over and done something that is unforgivable and yet you've been forgiven. There are so many ways that we um, overstep our boundaries in life. So many ways we treat people how we're not supposed to treat them. And yet, certain times, in certain circumstances, you'll still find that those same people will have, you know, the heart of compassion. So why can't these same people, these, um, what do you call them? I don't even know what you call these, border guards or security guys. I'm sure they, they ain't 100% clean. So why can't they just distinguish between the two types of returnees? And so, okay, these ones, you're still getting them out of the country. So what difference does it make? You're still getting them out. Why do you have to relish in giving them a hard time? You can just say, okay, these are immigration. Do things by the book. Do things properly. These have immigration issues. So we'll, we'll, we'll remove them and we'll do all that documentation for removal. These are deportees. These are the bad guys. So let's, you know, restrain, restrain them and do whatever we need to do to make sure we are safe. Make that distinction. But you don't lump everybody in the same boat. It's not right. And it's not fair. Um, it, apparently, um, Dr. Knife also said that those who... Those Jamaicans who left Jamaica and got involved in criminal activities are more likely to have been involved in criminal activities before they left Jamaica. Now, my question to that is, don't they investigate people's past before they allow them into the country? Don't they check their criminal background? Or is this a recent thing that they do? Or, did they, or do they just allow every, anybody to come in willy-nilly? I'm sure they must have some kind of link to an individual's background to know whether or not they've committed a crime before they let them in. Or is this a sudden reflection? You know, it's always, it's, it seems like it's like pulling the rug from under your feet as soon as you feel safe. That's what it feels like. It's a bit like those people on universal credit, the people on benefits. They had that kind of surety that the government was going to pay them. And I'm sure the majority of them thought the government was going to pay them for the rest of their lives. They didn't even bother. For those of you who saw Benefit Street, those people, benefits, getting benefits was a way of life. So they never, ever thought it would change. And then when the rug's pulled from underneath their feet, they're committing suicide, they're doing all sorts. But it's a similar thing because you've kind of brought people in under full security. They feel as though they're entitled to live here, but based on their heritage, based on their history. And then all of a sudden, the rules change, the rug's pulled from under their feet, and they, they've fallen over and they don't know what to do. I don't know.
Jamaicans tend to give deportees who have returned with no money a hard time because they interpret it as wasting an opportunity. So you see, with one thing with Jamaicans, they're a very proud race. When they go abroad, they try to do, the majority of them, try to build up themselves, do something that they can be proud of. They've got anybody coming from America and they're coming to visit. They want to make sure that their home looks good. I know that my mum, any time she, well, when she was younger, any time she had a visitor from America, all the new curtains come up, you know, she makes sure that the um, leather sofa is clean. She might even put down a new carpet. All the best china comes out because she wants them to see her success her relative success. But the thing is, is that with England, you can never compete with America and their style, whether or not they're knee-high in debt or not. You go to America, bloody hell. And I went to America, and my ball, um, lake in their backyard, you know. A long lake. Acres and acres of land. Houses, ha massive houses, you know what I mean? And, you know, you, you can just cannot. And the thing is, anybody who comes to America and they come to the UK, they'll always say, bloody hell, she lives in a bloody box. And the thing is, when I lived in America, I had a lovely house in uh, Maplewood, which is in New Jersey. And it had a um, basement and it was really lovely done. But, you know, and then my sisters were telling me, oh, they're going to come over to me in the UK. I'm like, oh, my God. I had to give them warnings. I'm like, listen, I live in a little box and I can't accommodate you. You're not going to have your own room because when I go to them, it's like I've got my own room. You know, it's like them have, some of those houses have two kitchens, two bathrooms. I mean... Talk about excess. But like I said, they pay out for it. Me, I prefer to live quite modestly and I like to live within my means. So therefore, I'm not out to impress. I just tell them the truth. Look, you can come over, but you're likely to have to sleep on the sofa in the living room and that's how it's going to be. Anyway, how did I get onto that? <sighs> I don't even know how I got onto that. Anyway, let me see where I am now. That's totally thrown me off, actually. Yes, yeah, so, um, so like I was saying, there is a stigma attached to deportees if they're um, reliant on family and friends. But if you come over there with money, you're seen as a returnee and there's no stigma. You could still be um, an involuntary migrant, but the fact that you've got enough money to sustain yourself, you're viewed totally differently. Um, Returnees um, have UK USA knowledge which they could use to their advantage. Um, remember that there's a lot of things that people in the UK and USA have learnt that could actually benefit people in Jamaica. So, you know, we have to kind of look at the positive sometimes and see, okay, how can how can we work together? How can we help each other? What is it that they know that we may not know yet? What because America is way ahead. So when they're leaving America and coming to Jamaica, there has to be business ideas and things that they've seen that they can implement in Jamaica. And especially when you think Jamaica, you, you know, you can hustle a little bit. So it's not like in another country where you're held down and you can't grow because of red tape everywhere. These people could actually help you with ideas. You could actually be a consultant, a motivational speaker, an author, an advisor. The world is your oyster, really. Once you get over the um, fear, because it, it must be quite a fearful experience and a humbling experience because you are going back with your head between your t with your head between your knees 
and until you get yourself on the ground and take advantage of um, development programs like open arms don't feel ashamed I mean they were talking about they want people to attend these outreach programs and I'm not sure whether or not they'd want to attend that because I got a funny feeling they might feel a bit targeted but I think the Jamaican culture is so different from the British culture let's talk about Britain for now that I think um, cultural integration needs to be they need to be trained in cultural integration so that they have that Jamaicans have that kind of resilience and, um, oh, I don't even know what to call it. But they have something that the British, especially the British men, don't have. And the British men need to tap into that Jamaican culture that gives them that strength and gives them that resilience and determination and balance it with their professionalism because British people tend to be quite polite and professional but if you could amalgamate the two cultures so that you come up with something positive that could benefit any everyone that might be the way to go I'm not quite sure what that is but somebody might think of something um, what else have we got here um, they were saying the involuntary returnees, um, they have skills that are needed in Jamaica. They have a good work ethic. They have various um, experiences. They also have undeclared skills. A lot of people have the impression that a lot of the returned, the involuntary returnees have no skills, but they have skills, but they're not declared. In other words, they kind of, you know, when people consider skills as something of a high level like um, IT or elect electronic or science but sometimes basic skills are just as useful like um, be, I think um, what's his name um, Miss Dr. Knife was talking about they have care home skills. We have a lot of Jamaicans who work in the care homes in this country because it's a place where you can work, you can do overtime, you can make money working in the care homes. You know, you can do long hours. And yes, you don't have much of a life, but that is how a lot of Jamaicans made money. And apparently that is a service that's well needed in Jamaica. And as long as you're trustworthy and you're not one of these who a robber or anything like that, you might even want to establish your own business, your own care home business. Few of you get together and offer that kind of um, business where, because you know what you're doing, you know what they need. The only thing you'll probably need is the resources. But that might even be an idea. But those are undeclared skills because a lot of um, men don't want to say that they were carers. They don't want to say that they, they were cleaning offices and doing all that kind of stuff. They feel a bit embarrassed about it. But, you know, if you are in construction work and if you are a carer or if you have any of these other um, undeclared skills, they can be put to good use. So I'm really glad I came across that CVM television. It's really a good um, program to keep on top of. Um, let me see. Um, what else is there? Yeah, we have to get away from the stigma attached to the deportee. Let's call them involuntary migrants for the time being, and that they are criminals and they have bad behaviour. On... Um, on this video the start of the on the start of this on the start of this cvm panel discussion this is what the public well one person's view of what a deportee should get when they come to jamaica research on a subject but before we begin our debate the public has a say <laughs> Yes, I believe the government should have a program to reintegrate the deportees. Even use them, train them to drive bus and use them to drive public passenger vehicles. 
and that you can have a closer eye on them. They are employed, you know where they are in and out. And work them back because they are Jamaican, they are human beings. The Bible said not one of us is good. So we have to work with them, retrain them, and so be it. Yeah, I'm going to put the link of the whole panel discussion below. But you see the perception. I mean, train them to drive buses and train them to drive vans. These people can drive. So what I'm saying about undeclared skills, it's almost like they feel as though they can't do anything and that you have to watch them as though they, they're going to do something wrong. And that's the perception we have to kind of get rid of. We have to understand that. I mean, there's no way you can know who's who, like I've said in previous videos. But you have to kind of understand that, you know, there is good and bad in everyone. And some of these people are more than capable of looking after themselves if given the opportunity and if given the foundation. And like I said, that Open Arms project seems to be, seems to, that it will give them the foundation. It gives them skill sets. It gives them training. Um, ah, it does so much. Um, let me see what else. They was asking, what's the recidivism rate? I've, what that means is, is that how many of them go back to crime? And they reckon 1%. There was 45,000. 91%. And that's because they did not have access to support. You know, but they reckon where there is support provided, there is no recidivism. Um, they reckon programs to support will facilitate a transformation. So apparently 200,000 homeless people have passed through open arms and I would imagine the majority of returning um, deport, returning migrants would be homeless if they haven't got family over there. So, oh yeah, the um, non-funding, the government funding from non-government organization comes from American Friends of Jamaica and the British High Commission. So Open Arms offers a drop-in service, rehabilitation, reintegration, residential um, services and a resettlement program. They, and also sustaining um, the individual through skills training and entrepreneurship um, what's that? courses, entrepreneurship courses. Um, they get an annual funding from the Ministry of Local Government and also the Ministry of Health. Um, they are considered a template for most other countries who are following their lead. Um, yeah, I think that this would be a good organisation to fund. I was looking for their account number, but you know what? It, I was so scared to do that because... When you've got, you don't know who's accessing the emails or the messages, not to, um, not to say I don't trust anyone in the organisation, but all I'm saying is that I would like to put down some bank details and I don't know that those bank details, who those bank details belong to. If I get an email from Yvonne McClymer Grant, giving me the bank details, and yes, I would edit this video and put them up. But if it's from anyone else, I'm just not going to provide those bank details. But like I said, um, Open Arms Development Centre is on Facebook. I'm going to put that link below. So just join them so you can participate. You can donate if you want. And I think that should be good. Also, which is quite, when I say that open arms gives them a sense of dignity, they don't call them homeless people or deportees or even returning migrants. They call them participants. That's a lovely, that's a lovely title. And they, they learn how to run businesses. Um, they've got staff who are in charge. They've got staff who are assistants. They've got staff in catering. They've got a store where people sell goods. They make stuff to sell. 
And um, the British High Commission has helped them to start up social enterprises to enable them to be more self-sustaining. So it's not all bad news. Uh, what else is this? 17 of the residents have jobs. Um, they provide training activities so they become more marketable. Um, returning migrants can sort themselves out after reintegration. Um, they help them with birth certificates and getting your tax registration number. Um, so somebody asked, who tracks um, deportees once they arrive in Jamaica? Um, because, you know, like we saw in one of those videos, this guy just walked off and we don't know where he went. He was just kind of whizzing off. But apparently they've got the Ministry of National Security who is supposed to know where the returning migrants are. But I guess they only know where they are if they tell them where they are. I mean, if these people don't want to be targeted or found, they won't be found. Um, Dr. What's his name again? It's hard to remember all these names. Kamawa. Knife, Dr. Knife. Strange name. Kamawande Knife. Um, he reckons, he was talking about they, they drafted a deportation policy, uh, but it's not been finalised, and this was drafted years ago. And it was to support the integration of deportees into Jamaican society. Um, this has not been finalised. They keep following it up, but nothing is happening. And the thing is, that would protect the police and the, and the returnees, which are often scapegoated because they haven't got no process to follow. So um, I think Dr. Knife is looking into that, continually bringing it up. Um, Apparently, the problem tardiness with regard to finalising the policy. So, yeah, they'll have to kind of get onto that. There's the inability of the government to finalise. We use people as scapegoats, deportees and police. Jamaica needs a framework to add to address the problem. People are doubly scapegoated in the UK, USA, and then when they arrive in Jamaica. And apparently they, Jamaica is preparing for a consistent influx. Ah, it is the last Thursday of every month. The last Thursday of every month. Between 40 and 60 Jamaicans are returned to the soil upon which they were born. And that's all I've got to say for now. Bye-bye.